Machine learning is it's actually kind of quite old as a term. It's uh, invented in the 1950s. And I've been involved in artificial intelligence for quite some considerable time. I did a PhD 30 years ago. Um, and it was interesting. I looked at machine learning as a technique to try and decided it wasn't going to work for what I was trying to do. And so I handcrafted a whole series of rules, and I put a load of energy and effort into making it work in a system that was successful and was used uh, commercially. But it's been fascinating in the last few years with the explosion of data, the digitization of techniques, and the explosion of compute power, particularly in the cloud. Machine learning has truly come of age. And the IDC quotes that of the digital transformation initiatives which are going to happen in this year, 2019, 40% of them are going to be empowered and supported by artificial intelligence. And I think I'd be bolder and suggest that if you're involved in digital transformation, if you're moving from an old approach to a new approach using digital techniques, and you're not using artificial intelligence and machine learning, you may be missing a trick, and you probably want to think about that. Customer experience, for example, is being transformed. Conversational interfaces like we're familiar with at home, with the Echo, where we just talk to it and Alexa answers back. Or personalization, when we talk to services and they understand who we are and they understand the data about us and they give a different treatment to us. This is becoming the expected norm for how people interact and it should be how they interact with our public services as well. Think about healthcare. There's a massive shift going through looking at using the vast amounts of data that have been locked away in the healthcare system to help shift from a reactive model of healthcare to a predictive model of healthcare, using the data to predict what we may need to do next. And also using that data for research and development to actually drive new treatments and new medicines coming, coming available. McKinsey have looked at healthcare and they thought that artificial intelligence would actually increase the productivity of nurses working in our hospitals by 50%. That's a massive step change. So really, right across, whether it's customer experience, whether it's back office operations, which we could optimize, whether it's enabling decisions to happen at scale more effectively, more efficiently, more consistently, whether it's driving economic change and advantage to actually be more effective, or revolutionary new approaches and innovations, AI and machine learning are, under power, are powering the digital transformation. Let's step into this. And I like to think that it's really important to explore not just the art of the possible, but also the art of the practical. So often, people get excited by the technologies, the techni technical techniques, the machine learning algorithms, what we can do with data, and they lose sight of the wider picture of how does this fit in the commercial or business context. I think it's really good to think about the art of the practical, to think about if we're going to make a change with machine learning, how will it drive business value? How do we actually look at the whole process from one end to the other to see the delivery of value? How realistic is it to actually execute on the results of this? Are we in a position that if I build a new predictive model, it will actually be used it will actually fit into people's working practices. And do we have the data available to drive this? Each of these are kind of key questions to start off with. But I'd like to kind of think about AWS's wider mission here. And that is to put machine learning into the hands of every developer. And to make it easier for data scientists and machine learning practitioners to do their work. You know, thinking back to when I was doing my PhD, I actually spent a huge amount of time learning to program in C++ to write dynamic link libraries. And I learned a load about managing memory in the computer to page in and page out different chunks of rules for the rule system that I was developing. And all that kind of heavy lifting of managing libraries and things. Why, why was I doing that when I was really trying to focus the research that I was doing around the, machine, the AI aspects? So our mission at AWS is to simplify machine learning. We want to make it easier for developers to build intelligent applications. We want to make it easier for data scientists and machine learning practitioners to do the end-to-end -end process of machine learning. How are we doing that? Well, what are we actually solving for? It's probably three key things we're looking at. Firstly, enabling data scientists to do data science. 
And sadly, the case is today, many organizations that data scientists spend about 20% of their time actually deriving insights from data using machine learning, and 80% of their time doing other undifferentiated stuff, preparing data, managing data, managing compute environments. That's the wrong way around. We should be spending more time data scientists focused on data science. We also recognize an awful lot of companies that are not leveraging data in their organizations to best advantage. While 60% recognize that they should be doing it, only 28% really believe they're generating strategic value from their data. How do we make more of the data available? How do we make it easier to consume that data for insight purposes? And finally, analytics video have quoted a statistic that 50% of all the predictive models that get built actually get implemented. In other words, half of all the work building predictive models is wasted. They're never actually put into operation, never deployed. We need to make it easier to manage the deployment of machine learning models at the, at the end. So our unique approach, and you've heard a little bit about this in the keynote session, I'm gonna expand on that, is to be incredibly customer-focused customer and obsess about how we can drive improvements into our platform. 90% of our machine learning roadmap comes directly from what customers are asking us for. The other 10% is what we believe they will be asking us for or believe they will be needing. Uh, we have a phenomenal pace of innovation, 200 releases in the last year around our machine learning platform. We have more breadth and depth of machine learning capabilities than any other provider. And we're explicitly multi-framework in doing that. So whether it's PyTorch or TensorFlow or MXNet, whatever your preferred flavor, or actually in truth, what the right framework for your problem may be, we will support it and optimize it onto the AWS cloud. So you're not locked into any single framework. There's a comprehensive platform built on top of the security and analytics that exist within the wider AWS cloud. So you've got the right data storage, you've got the right security mechanisms, you've got the right analytical services, you've got an extensive capability around ingesting data into a data lake and analyzing it in effective and efficient ways, be that for really, really high volume petabytes of data, or be that for multiple, multiple feeds that you need to stitch together. It's also kind of interesting in terms of how do we do research and development. I mean, some organizations focus their research and development effort in a kind of ivory tower where they're working long way away from the customers. That's not the AWS approach. We have our research and development teams closely coupled with our customers, hearing their views and working that development really close to the customer usage. So how does that map out? We actually are seeing more, well, tens of thousands of customers using machine learning on the AWS cloud. Uh, we're seeing that uh, deep learning, 81% of all the deep learning happens on the AWS cloud. And TensorFlow, the Google's open sourced deep learning model, 85% of it is running on the AWS cloud. We have invested heavily in optimizing these frameworks and are proud at the moment to be holding the top three spots of the Dawn's deep learning benchmarks, the top three spots for the fastest training time for the models, the top spot for the lowest training cost, the top three spots for the lowest inference latency, and the top three spots for the lowest inference cost. So industry benchmarks, we're excelling at them. But being much more practical, who's actually using AWS machine learning and AI? So looking at our public sector client base, it's quite wide and it's quite diverse, and it's growing all the time. So looking across this, we're seeing every segment in the public sector, be that government organizations, universities, educational institutions, schools, not-for-profits, healthcare organizations, all looking to adopt machine learning. FINRA, the United States' largest securities regulator, they are using data, to ident using data and machine learning to identify fraud and anomalous activities in the securities markets. Uh, closer to Europe, the RNIB in the UK, a not-for-profit focus on supporting those uh, with blindness, they're using our machine learning, our, our AI services, to using text-to-speech in particular to read books to blind people. But what really excites me, 
having actually been in this field, as I said, for 30 years now, is it's still really early days. It's really exciting to see new techniques being applied, new applications being taken up, and real change to the citizens in our societies being driven real benefit to them. And I want to unpack how we actually achieve that. And I think there's two sides. There's a technology side, and I'm going to unpack the stack of technology in a moment, but there's also a culture shift that's necessary. And at the end of the session, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cultural changes which are needed too. So thinking first about the technology, how do we create the right stack of AI and machine learning services for people to use? We have a wide and extensive stack. And what's really exciting is you can tailor your adoption of the different services according to your own needs. It's not one size fits all. It's a wide and extensive capability, and you can choose from it. We lay it out in three different tiers. So right at the top, we have AI services, which are easy for developers to use, um, easy to add into programs, capabilities. And I'll show a little bit of that. I'll actually show you some code. Um, but don't be scared. It's really easy. In the middle, we've got machine learning services, which are kind of for developers who want to adopt algorithms quickly and easy, or it's for data scientists who want to create, use a highly productive environment. Amazon SageMaker deliver, does for you the heavy lifting, takes away some of the complexity and some of the guesswork, and helps you with each of the step of a machine learning process. And down at the lowest tier, there's the machine learning frameworks. So, which is really for expert machine learning practitioners, for research to, researchers and developers who are pushing the boundaries of what can be achieved with these techniques. So if they're comfortable with building models and tuning them themselves, training and then figuring out how to deploy that into production, they've got a broad array of compute options for training and inference. They've got the most powerful GPU-based instances in the cloud, compute and memory optimized instances, and if it's relevant, field gate programmable arrays that they can use. So a wide range for them to focus on what they need. But let me step into this in terms of a product range. AI services, as I've talked about at the top, we have uh, our recognition video, recognition image services, TextRact, a new service released just at the end of last year for understanding documents, understanding particularly forms, words within documents. Awful, awful lot of our business processes within the public sector are re still receiving forms and understanding the content of that. What if we can get that automation through a computer? Poly to turn text into lifelike speech. Transcribe to do the converse of taking speech and turning it into well-written prose. Translate, translating between languages with, uh, with, with neural networks to do that, comprehend, to understand what words are about. Interestingly, looking at forecast and personalized, these are following a pattern that we have seen over many, many years. So AWS was born out of Amazon.com recognizing that we actually had a core competency around web services at massive scale. That core competency was something we could release to other people to use and to build their web services in the cloud. Well, for many years before working for Amazon, I've often used the example of on the Amazon.com site, there's that little box that says, people, you might want to be interested in these other products. That's actually a phenomenally successful box. That next best, recommend, next best action recommendation thing, that recommendation engine, enables us to personalize for you what the right things for you that you may be interested in. But it's quite smart, because it does it in a way that builds up a profile of what you've previously purchased. It understands what you've been most recently looking at on the, on the site, the digital footprint of your current activity. And it is also cognizant of actually what stock's available in our, in our warehouses. So thinking of those three different things, bringing that together with some complex deep learning capabilities, we're using the next best recommendations. And that capability is now released in personalized for other people to use too. Our fulfillment centers, massive great big warehouses with vast amounts of stock, have got a complex problem of forecasting what's going to be bought, how long will new stock take to reach us from our suppliers, and what should we be ordering? If you think about retail, it's, it's a relatively low margin operation, so running out of stock is critical. We need to keep the right amount of stock for the orders that are going to come in. This actually is a hard forecasting problem. And it's a problem that we focused 
uh, our machine learning team actually in Cambridge in England uh, over many years, and they've used a lot of Bayesian techniques to try to come up with sophisticated ways of forecasting. We've now packaged that capability up into a service available in AWS for everybody to use. So if you wanted to use our forecasting algorithms to predict any given trend line that you need for your services, there's a quick and easy way to do it. Across the middle layer, machine learning services, SageMaker makes model building and training easier. Uh, it creates pre-built environments, development notebooks for you to use, using algorithms that have been optimized for petabyte scale data sets, and automatically does the model tuning for you. We've baked in a lot of the optimizations for you. For example, SageMaker is pre-configured with the latest Intel optimized versions of TensorFlow and Apache MXNet. So maximum performance running on top of our C5 instances in AWS, running Intel Xeon Platinum processors. But when you're running it, you don't need to know all that because it's doing it for you. That's the beauty of it. And at the bottom level of this, we've got all these frameworks which are quick and easy to use. So if you've got data scientists in your team and they spend a lot of their life downloading the right libraries and configuring the right environment, well, actually, they could be using our deep learning Amazon machine images, or Delamis, as we sometimes call them, which will quickly fire up an environment for them, for them to build their models with everything pre-configured to go. But let's step back up to the AI services at the top and think about recognition for a moment. Recognition allows you to take images and video and quickly add analysis to that. So you can identify within images the objects, the people, the text, the background, the activities, you could even spot inappropriate content. So if you're taking any user-generated images and wanting to make them available, perhaps on your website, you need to check that nobody's sending you something that would be hugely embarrassing if you were to put it out there. So our unsafe content detection will quickly spot the sort of salacious material folks may be sending you just to trick you. Um, people have used this in a number of ways. I get really excited by some of them. We've got a client, a partner, called uh, Marinus, who have created a product called Traffic Jam Face Search, which is actually looking at the, the rather horrific problem of human trafficking, where humans have been literally stolen and sold for all sorts of horrific crimes. And in order to detect this, the images that the families provide of their missing ones are sent to the officers, who then search through some of the most evil and depraved content you could find on the internet to try to match up, is this person, that person, or not. So with Marinus's Traffic Jam face search tool, they can do that automatically. So what used to take hours or days can be done in minutes with higher accuracy. And therefore, they can actually intervene and stop some of the worst evil crimes around human trafficking. But an interesting side benefit from the employee's perspective is they've reduced the level of stress there's genuinely been cases of post-traumatic stress ar arising from these officers spending their lives looking at some of the most depraved content on the internet. So I said I was going to show a bit of code. I'd just like to ask, how hard is this to do? So on the, uh, on the left, we've got a picture of Andy Jassy, our senior vice president. On the right, there's an interview. And I'm pretty sure the person on the right is Andy Jassy being interviewed. If we wanted the computer to tell us, we could feed this into Amazon recognition and it will give us that there's a confidence of 98% that it is. How hard do we do that with code? A secret for data science is actually most development these days is where somebody finds a worked example and tweaks it. So here's a worked example that you could find in our documentation and tweak it slightly. All you need to do is actually to specify an S3 bucket, my photos bucket, the key S for source and the key T for target with the headshot and the interview, then open up the client for recognition. Uh, in fact, opening up in Australia, the region of uh, Southeast 2. And then call the compare faces function within that API client, passing in the source image, key S, and the target image, key T. And get back the, uh, the response, and that's the confidence, and print it out. So it's really only about six lines of code, which you could have found the template for and adapted. That's how easy it is to use these services. So across the AI services, we've got a range like transcribes to automatic speech recognition, translate between different languages, poly, generating natural language from text to
to here. Duolingo, one of the popular language learning platforms, have used this extensively to 170 million users to help them learn foreign languages. Uh, and they actually evaluated the whole market of text-to-speech providers, and Amazon Polly won in every one of the scenarios they tested. Amazon Comprehend to do natural language processing, and Lex at the bottom to build those conversational interfaces. And in the, in the States, it's interesting, uh, an organization, a big insurer, Liberty Mutual, actually used Lex to create an internal chatbot for their own staff to help employees quickly get answers to questions and complete common tasks automatically. That kind of internal knowledge, how much more productive can we make our own staff? Echo have applied this in the space of education by recording lectures, using Transcribe to create a record of that lecture, and then let you search straight through it to find the right piece. And I mentioned Comprehend. So Comprehend lets you pull out entities like key, key entities, phrases, language, and sentiment from documents. And you can automatically cluster documents into different themes, so different topics that are existing within them. It's quite exciting that you can also add custom entities to it. So you're not fixed to the entities that we can spot. You can add your own. And you can build custom classifiers. So if you know that this set of documents are actually of this type, you can build a cluster, a, a, a model to build that automatically within there. And I'm having a number of conversations with people around the theme of managing inbound communications, inbound conversations and emails to route them to the right person quickly. Moving into the middle layer, the machine learning stack. We've actually helped data scientists focus on doing data science. There's a, there's a lot of steps to data science, actually. Working from the left, you've got to collect and prepare the data. You've got to find the right algorithm. You've got to optimize it. You've got to manage the computer environments to do that. The tuning, the training, and then moving it into, the, into deployment, into production, which can be quite hard, because the world of IT tends to talk in different languages and use different approaches and cultures. And the world of data science is much more exploratory uh, more of a research act activity. So moving from one to the other can be hard. And then scaling and managing this inference that, uh, in the production can be tricky. SageMaker seeks to address all of those with these three core areas of building, training, and deploying. Within, the, within each of these steps, you can use as much or as little as you need. So some of our clients use the first two to build and train and then deploy the models into their own deployment in, um, environments or run them locally. Other people actually build their own models and use them in our deployment platform. It's, it's up to you to choose. A lot of the popular frameworks like TensorFlow are pre-installed, pre-built in. But if you want to train with your own alternative frameworks or your own algorithms, if your data scientists want to actually be more productive but using the low-level frameworks, they can package up their work into Docker containers and fit them into the SageMaker environment. Now, SageMaker is actually being enhanced at a phenomenal pace. Over the last year, 2018, we had 90 new enhancements. I'm not going to go through them all. But one of them is genuinely exciting reinforcement learning which we saw in the keynote around Deep Racer. Uh, reinforcement learning is a fascinating new technique where labeled data isn't needed, but you specify the outcome. So actually, I want to race my autonomous vehicle. I want it to go fast down the straights. I want it to slow for the bend. I want it to go around the bends quickly. We support multiple different reinforcement learning environments, both 2D and 3D ones. We've got commercial simulation environments, such as MATLAB and Simulink. And we're allowing you to add anything built on top of the open source OpenAI Gym interface. So really a rich environment for doing reinforcement learning, which drives through by having a simulation of all the possible scenarios, a scoring algorithm for how good you're going at the moment, and a deep learning environment as well. It is the area that's seeing some of the most exciting advances in machine learning to date. But I wanted to quickly step through the SageMaker world. So SageMaker is built from pre-built notebooks for common problems. We have a large library of pre-built notebooks for people to pick up, look at, reuse, and tweak to their own environments. Within it, there's a number of different algorithms that have been pre-built. I think it's about 18 at the moment. It does keep increasing. Uh, for you, SageMaker, as you run one line of code to say, please train against this data set using this algorithm, it will fire up containers and do all of the training for you 
close down the container, present back the model for you. So it's quick and easy to do, uh, taking advantage of scalable Intel Xeon processors to run advanced compute heavy workloads if you need to. But in terms of CPU suitability, we've got a range of compute choices. So often data scientists, whilst they're just developing their code, will work on quite small processors. And then when they want to scale it up to pre-production or full testing, they're running on the fastest data, run it on the fastest processors we can. Model optimization, we packaged hyperparameter optimization to allow you to search through many different uh, algorithm, many different sets of hyperparameters to get the best results. And deployment can happen by one line of code to create a containerized environment which will employ your model. And you can then scale it with auto-scaling around the top. You could also download it into different environments to run it at the edge if you need to using Greengrass and our IoT systems. So you could run your models in auto-scaling clusters or you could run them right at the edge. It's up to you. It's entirely, entirely at your choice. I'd just like to give uh, one example before in inviting a guest to give another example. Uh, GE Healthcare have been harnessing data and analytics coming from their systems. They build some of the best scanning devices, the radio X-ray machines, the CT scans, the MRI scans in hospitals. And when you need somebody to interpret that scan, actually you really need somebody to interpret that scan quickly. So you need it to be done in, in a timely way, you need a really accurate interpretation of it, and you need it at the right time for your critical healthcare. Now, if you're in, say, the United States, they've got one consultant radio radiologist to look at these scans for every 10,000 people. But in other parts of the world, say Kenya, there's only one for every 240,000 people. What if we could take the expertise of the consultant radiologist and package it into the machine? And that's exactly the challenge they've looked at. They've built deep learning models to identify critical conditions, scanning and highlighting the area of for seriousness. For example, if you've got a collapsed lung, it could be seen, if you know what you're doing, on a radiograph. And they've trained deep learning models to do exactly the same. They've gathered data from consultants right around the world to build, label these scans, and build SageMaker models to deploy these models at the edge within their machinery on lots of different types of devices. And so far, they're focused on building that out, but their ambition is to build out thousands of algorithms for thousands of conditions on lots of devices at the edge, which is truly exciting. So for a bit of a change of tone and pace, I'm going to invite uh, Florian, who's one of the co-leaders and founders of Radix AI, who worked with VDAB. Thank you, Neil. Good afternoon. Do you hear me? Um, so before lunch, uh, I hope you all saw Guido from VDAB um, explaining how they work together with a startup to build a job matching system. Uh, well, that startup was Radix.ai, of which I am one of the founders. Uh, and we are known for making AI real. Uh, and that's also what I want to do today uh, by going a bit deeper in the job matching system by explaining um, how, um, why we chose deep learning, uh, also how the model works, uh, and then also show some interesting results from the matching. Um, so VDAB, uh, the Belgians of you might already know them. Um, this is their strategy. Uh, they are focused on a digital first approach, which means that their services should be available 24 seven and that um, the citizens, if they want, they should be able to completely uh, serve themselves. But they also focus on the human digital aspect, which means that they will be actively looking uh, at which people uh, need some help and also actively uh, try to help them. And then uh, they come into the face-to-face -face step where there are uh, a number of experts on different industries that work together with people who are having a more hard time to find a job. Uh, now, if you look at that first part of the strategy, the digital first, um, then you can already expect it's very important to have a high quality job matching system. So if you have your CV on their website, you would like to receive the best suggestions. Um, and the matching problem exists already for 20 years uh, and they started um, as uh, the previous AI systems were by building 
rule-based uh, matching. So they look at the person, they see that it's from Brussels, uh, and the job is from Alcina, so the algorithm can compute the distance and sees that it's a match. Um, but then the person is a babysitter, but the job asks for a nanny, so no match. And then the person has a structured field English, but the job mentions casually speaks English, so again, no match. And then the person has a driving license B, but in the job it's not literal, it just mentions driving. Uh, so this is really something that we hope that AI will be able to solve for us. Um, and we have some other uh, problems that might be improved with AI. Um, one thing is a rule-based system uh, demands a lot of work. The job market is evolving and each year there are many people who have as a full-time job to keep this system up to date. So that's a large pain and still it isn't performing perfectly. Um, also, the current system uh, works in two directions. So if you have a person, you can suggest jobs. And if you have a job, you can suggest the best uh, passing people, uh, best matching people. Um, but it would also be nice if you have found the perfect employee, uh, maybe to look at lookalike people. Uh, or if you have found your perfect job, but it's not available, um, maybe it would be interesting to see very similar jobs. And then a last problem is that it's Dutch only and here in Belgium alone we have three languages and it would be very nice to be able to match French people to a job uh, over the border and so on. Um, so how do we solve this? Well, Radix is a team of engineers that built AI services uh, and I'll quickly um, recap um, what we mean by AI. So, AI is the general concept of machines showing human intelligence. Um, it's just a concept, so it, it can be achieved with many technologies. One of the bigger ones is uh, machine learning. Um, machine learning is a specific technology that, that learns from data to make predictions uh, and in that way achieves artificial intelligence. Um, and then one of the a smaller box is deep learning that is within machine learning um, and deep learning is actually the use of neural networks and neural networks uh, as depicted here uh, they are based on the way that our brain functions and basically uh, you want some input data to go in for example a job uh, and a job seeker then based on millions of parameters some calculations will happen and in the end, you want it to predict an output such as what is the matching score between this person and this job. Uh, so um, for the job matching, we choose to use uh, deep learning to solve this AI problem. Um, and there are two main reasons for that. Uh, the first one is that with deep learning, um, the scale improves performance. And what I mean by that is um, if you have a very complex problems such as the job market which contains a lot of uh, different relationships and are very hard to map uh, then deep learning uh, can really improve the performance if there is enough data and that's the second uh, thing you need to have a good deep learning system is enough data and in the case of VDAB we have millions of examples of people uh, and jobs so both um, things are there um, and a second important reason why we use deep learning is because deep learning uh, is really able to understand uh, natural language uh, and to, to give the information from the language to the algorithm. The way it does that is it is able to translate words um, into numbers that capture their meaning. Uh, and this is a visualization of this translation to uh, numbers. This is a word cloud uh, where you can see that words that have semantic similarities are together such as nanny and babysitter will be very close together and so our algorithm will know that they mean the same. And there's more. It's not only about the semantics of words uh, but it also contains relationships. So if you take the word king, you subtract the word man and you add the word woman, what do you get? Queen, exactly. Uh, so this is also something the, the model will have access to. Um, and this is then a high-level overview of the model. You've already seen this slide in Hido's slide. 
Um, but I will now go a bit more into detail in how it works. Um, so ideally, you would feed uh, a profile containing um, structured and unstructured data, such as age, uh, location, but also description of the work experience, the skills, and so on. Um, you would like to feed that to a model, and then you would also like to feed uh, a vacancy which contains the description of the vacancy, including necessary uh, experience uh, requirements, and so on. And then you would like the model to uh, produce a score, a matching score. Um, and then, of course, the question is, how do you get the model to actually create an accurate matching score? Uh, well, the secret is, uh, it's in the learning part of deep learning. This model needs to learn. And where does it learn from? Well, it learns from historical matches. Uh, so the VDAB has um, millions of uh, interest signals. Um, for example, if a, person, if a person clicks on a job a few times, we know he's probably interested if he applies for a job. That's a signal if he actually um, works at a job. That's also a signal. Um, so what we do is to train the model. Um, well, before training, this model uh, contains all random parameters because they are untrained. So the calculation um, will be random, and the matching score will be random. Um, but if we have uh, a person and a job that we know are a match, then we actually uh, want the output to be high. So if this random output is high, then we say, okay, model, good job, we don't have to change you. But if uh, the outcome is low, then we have to tweak uh, the parameters a little bit in the right direction. And this is the principle, it, this principle is called gradient descent. That's one of the core uh, algorithms behind machine learning. And if you do that for millions of examples uh, of, of interest signals, then in the end, you get a model that truly understands why uh, and when a person and a job belong together. Um, so the result is improved matching. Um, and we offer this to the VDAB as an API. So they can uh, integrate it in their apps, but in all different services, for example, also for employers is being used, and also internally the consultants who help the people also um, make use of this uh, algorithm which is exposed as an API. Um, and some extra features, so our problem of heavy workloads being, needing to update the model is solved because it's a self-learning system, we can just retrain it every month. Um, we now have a four-way matching, so we can actually have look-alike profiles and look-alike jobs. Uh, and it's a multilingual model, so we can match with people from abroad. Um, and I will end up with three nice examples. And this is my personal favorite. It's about a guy who has done woodworking his whole life, uh, but lately he's, he was also interested in doing childcare. Uh, and our system proposed an actual vacancy from the database, which was a playground builder. Um, the second one is a person who studied social work. She was also interested in education. Um, and the job that uh, came up was a crisis relief worker. That's somebody who helps people with personal crises. Uh, and if you read the description, you'll see that it's a match. Um, and a third example is somebody who is an operational coordinator, and in fact, that matches really well with a lean coach. Um, so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian. I wanted to conclude by thinking a little bit about how do we drive transformation. Um, I talked about technology, and we've looked at a lot of the technology sets, but there needs to be a culture shift too. So what are, the, what are the keys in this area? I think there's a real need for leadership around machine learning. It isn't something that's just a technology that you can identify and isolate and work in the technology world, but it's something that actually has a much wider and disruptive influence. People are genuinely thinking, how will AI affect our workplace, our societies? And I think as leaders, we need to be thinking of that very carefully, and we need to be providing leadership how do we actually recognize those system-wide impacts? Maybe it's going to change people's jobs. Maybe it's going to change our business processes. Maybe it's going to change our interface with our citizens. We need leadership in that space. 
Um, too much that I see in terms of machine learning is focused on the technology. I think we need to be absolutely laser focused onto the business value, looking at the practical, looking at how will we drive value from this. And it needs a wider set of skills. So too often we think just about the data scientists and the technologists and the machine learning practitioners. I think we need to widen our teams out. We need to be thinking about the business analysis, the financial modeling, and the transformation skills. I mean, maybe we, we think about adding AI to a call center to answer some of the short calls. Well, we can answer calls quickly if they're easy calls, but that will give us fewer fewer calls to the contact center, but they'll be longer and they'll be harder. So the KPIs that we've actually got for our contact center may then be wrong if we're driving down our average handling time. We need to think really carefully about that. Keys to success. AI machine learning is great at scaling decision making, but I think you need to guard against it scaling bad decisions. You need to be focused really carefully on driving good decisions and making machine learning work well. Care is needed to establish the right governance. Um, the EU recently published the papers from their high-level expert group on AI, and it's interesting to look at that, and they suggest perhaps creating an ethics board to define the policy of what AI and machine learning can be used for, and what data can be used, and in what way. Investing in ethics and compliance and info security is absolutely key as well as scoping the business problem really, really well. So you can see how value will be driven out as you go. I wanted to show an example of bias. Bias is a key problem. In terms of developing algorithms, we need to guard against bias. This is an example actually coming from the Second World War. So it's quite old now. But the, the, the suggestion was, and it, it was in the Navy where they had uh, airplanes, and they were they were concerned that too many aeroplanes were being shot down by the enemy firing at them. Uh, and they wanted to go, well, where are the bullets hitting our planes? Perhaps we could add some plating onto our planes to make them stronger against bullets. So they looked at all the planes which had come back from battles, and they brought together the, the analysis of where all the bullet holes were to create this composite image showing the regions where bullets were hitting the planes. But then they intended to put plating onto the planes in these regions where all the red dots are, because that's where the bullets hit them. Until a statistician spoke up and went, no, that, that would be a mistake. We should put the plating on the areas which are blank. And they went, you what? You're mad. Look at the data. And they went, no, 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 no. The data we're looking at is of all the planes which survived. All the planes which were shot on the nose, or on the tail, or on the front of the wings, we haven't got them anymore, we lost them, they went down. In other words, the data set you're using to create this prediction is biased. It's a classic problem of survivor analysis. You haven't actually got the ones who didn't survive. And so often, we are blind to the biases. We need to protect against unconscious bias. One way of doing that is actually to promote diversity and to see within your team as diverse a range, neurodiversity, people who think differently, uh, people from different countries, different races, different nationalities, different languages. We need to think carefully about how we do that, how we bring that together. So finally, and in closing, we need to close the loop between the business team and the technology team. We need to focus carefully on the data strategy how do you advance your data strategy within your organization and organize for success? I think I've presented to you a great range of services. I look forward to seeing you use them. Thank you.